Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Todd Melke. I'm the CEO here at Greater Spokane Incorporated. I want to welcome you today to our annual um, State of the County Address. This event is sponsored and are presented uh, in partnership with Spokane County and Greater Spokane Incorporated. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to Commissioner Mary Cuny for representing Spokane County today and all the work that it's done on behalf of the Spokane region. And I think it's only fitting that the chair of the Board of County Commissioners uh, is here giving this speech, giving the state of the county on this day, International Women's Day. So thank you so much. Seems very fitting. So as we move into our program today, and on behalf of GSI, I certainly want to thank you for your leadership, your partnership, and the support to build a healthy and thriving economy. Thank you so much for your leadership and that of your team at Spokane County. Thank you. So GSI would also like to recognize um, uh, our partners, uh, the Greater Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce, as well as the West Plains Chamber of Commerce, for their partnership on today's event. Uh, we have uh, Lance Beck, President and CEO of Spokane Valley uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I know um, we're expecting shortly Tony, uh, Toby Bromling, the Executive Director of the West Plains Chamber of Commerce, uh, here with us. So Lance, if you'd stand, I'd like to make sure that people see you and we can recognize you. So we encourage you to join our conversation today on social media using uh, hashtag State of the County. I believe that's on the screens. Uh, so feel free to chime in uh, as we move forward uh, in today's program. At this time, and I've had the pleasure of introducing this person before, um, and it's just an amazing talent, but I would like to welcome the United States Air Force Senior Air, um, Airman Mary Dunkley from Fairchild Air Force Base to sing the national anthem. Would you please stand? Senior Airman Dunkley. I'd like to now welcome Chaplain Mark Smith with the Spokane County Sheriff's Department to lead us with a moment of reflection. Please join me in a time of guided reflection. We are grateful for the food and we will remember the hungry. We are grateful for our health and we will remember the sick. We are grateful for our friends, and we will remember the friendless. We give sincere thanks for this opportunity to meet together and for the opportunity to become better acquainted with our fellow associates. 
Let us gain the tools and knowledge as leaders and supervisors to better guide and inspire the people that we work with. May we listen intently with the purpose of bettering each other and our communities. May we accept new ideas and fresh ways of thinking to better ourselves and all those that we work with. Let us learn from today, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. Thank you. At this time, I would like to recognize some of the elected officials in the audience. I hope, this is always a risky prospect, uh, uh, proposition. I hope I recognize everybody uh, that's here uh, with regard to the elected officials and dignitaries that we have in the audience. From the city of Cheney, Mayor Chris Grover, if you please stand as I call your name and hold your applause until the end, but uh, Mayor Chris Grover. From the city of Spokane Valley, Mayor Rod Higgins, Council Member Brandy Peets, Council Member Ben Wick, Council Member Sam Wood, and Council Member Arnie Woodard. From Spokane County, we have Commissioner Josh Kearns, we have County Clerk Tim Fitzgerald, County Assessor Tom Konis, Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich, uh, I am going to recognize uh, Commissioner Mary Cuny as well, uh, as well as County CEO Jerry Gimmel. And I also want to recognize uh, our base commander um, from Fairchild Air Force Base, Colonel Salmi, if you want to stand. And I believe I saw uh, Larry Haskell join us, is that right? Thank you very much, and so uh, I want to thank you all for your service uh, to our community, to our country, uh, and to the Spokane region. So um, please join me in recognizing our elected officials. Hopefully I didn't miss anyone. So the work that we do here at GSI would not be possible with a group of very dedicated community leaders. Uh, they are the leadership of GSI. It's our board of trustees. Um, I would like to ask them to stand and be recognized uh, for the work that you do on behalf of this organization. So if our Board of Trustee members would stand at this time, that would be terrific. Thank you. So the state of the county address is supported by, by many um, organizations, community organizations. So join us in recognizing our title and luncheon sponsor for today's event, Spokane Federal Credit Union. First, please join me in welcoming Charlotte Nemec, CEO of Spokane Federal Credit Union, to the stage. Well, good morning, Spokane. I just have to say, could the groundhog have been more wrong? I mean, come on, winter was just starting when he said, it's all over. I'm a little disappointed in him, I have to say. So, as Todd mentioned, I'm Charlotte Nemec, and I'm here with Spokane Federal Credit Union, and I'm thrilled to be here as the sponsor of the State of the County Address. I don't know about you, but as an audience member, I often wonder, why does a company choose to be a sponsor? So, I figure that's a good place for me to start. Our why behind sponsoring this event is, with, is not without some foresight from us, it's because of county employees that started our credit union that I stand here today. And 60 years ago plus, 60 plus years ago, they started our credit union and this is our small way of giving back to our forefathers, but also a way for us to say thank you to the county employees who continue to support our credit union today. Speaking of why, that's a word that's really become popular thanks to Simon Sinek. I often hear people talking about their personal why and comp companies identifying their why. Another thing we have heard a lot about lately are core values. What are your personal core values? What is your company's core values? That got me to thinking about my personal why and my personal core values, which of course leads me to contemplating life. But you know, we really don't have time for me to contemplate my life today, so I'll just move on. So play along with me here, and I'll tie this all together for you. When you were young, how many of you knew what you wanted to be when you grew up? No, seriously, come on, you guys. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you grew up? Okay, so a few of you. How many of you are actually doing what you thought you knew you were going to do when you grew up? Okay, maybe a few less of you. So <laughs> as we grow up, we don't always stick with the plan that we had at 10 years old. I thought I was going to be a nurse. 
I liked helping people, and so this seemed like a perfectly good option for me. Well, that idea was shot down when my grandparents came to visit, and as my grandfather was walking up the steps, he tripped with a bottle of wine in his hand, fell, and nearly sliced off his pinky finger. The blood, oh my god, the blood, it was insane, and I passed out. So, just like that, my plan was shot. Because apparently, being a nurse requires you to be exposed to blood. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, but the good news is, I had identified my personal why, my personal core value, which was helping and caring for others. So how do you turn that into a career which doesn't involve blood? Well, enter the career of HR and eventually leadership, where caring and showing you care makes a difference. In this career, I am at home leading from my heart and not shy about showing that I care to my members and to our staff. After all, in the words of our local uh, leadership guru, Kevin Parker, leading from the interior is where the magic happens. So I'd like to tell my 10-year-old self, yeah, you go girl. Yeah, I did it. My personal core values of caring for others is what drove my choice when I was young and it has stuck with me as I grew up. Just as the values of Spokane County have continued to remain at the forefront as our community has continued to grow. And grow we are. It's amazing to see all the things happening all around our county. New businesses moving in. Hello, Amazon Fulfillment Center. New families finding a home here. Our parks and surrounding recreation expanding. I can't wait to see what that uh, Sportsplex has in store for us. And there's just a general overall feeling of prosperity and growth here. What I find comforting is our community isn't just growing for growth's sake. Our local government is working with the GSI, local businesses, and community partners to grow in a healthy way. This resonates with me because that's the same trajectory Spokane Federal is on as well. As we often say at the Credit Union, we don't want to be the biggest, we want to be the best. We want to value the way our county is planning and carefully growing, just as we are. One of Spokane Federal's core values is celebrating our success. So I'd like to celebrate the success of Spokane County employees. Can I get all of the county employees in attendance today to stand? Can we give them a big round of applause? Thank you for all that you do to make this county what it is. We know that your time and effort is not always come easy and we really appreciate it. So now comes the shameless plug because let's just face it, the reason companies sponsor these things is for that shameless plug. So we'd love to take you, we'd, I'd like to invite you all um, to follow Spokane Federal on social media. We'd love to take you along on our journey as we make some big changes in 2019. And at the risk of repeating myself, we aren't just making these changes to grow. We're making these changes so we are better able to serve the needs of our current members and all of the rest of Spokane County who want and need financial products and services that will help to strengthen not just their own finances, but also our communities. So check us out because here in Spokane County and at Spokane Federal, we grow. Thank you again, Todd, and the staff of GSI for allowing us to be here. It's an honor to be a part of this community, a community that has stayed true to its mission and value of enhancing and protecting the quality of life for all of us. Thanks, and have a great day, everyone. Okay. I should uh, back up a little bit. When I was recognizing elected officials, um, Larry Haskell, prosecuting attorney, Larry Haskell. Sorry, I didn't give your title. Uh, and Toby, will you stand up? Toby Bromling from the West Plains Chamber of Commerce, one of our partners, uh, has joined us. I want to make sure everybody knows you, sees you, to recognize you. Thank you for joining us. So thank you, Charlotte, for those comments. We also have with us today our Community Colleges of Spokane, a major sponsor of the event. Representing Community Colleges of Spokane is Dr. Christine Johnson, Chancellor and former GSI Board Chair. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson to stage. Thank you very much and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. 
On behalf of the Community Colleges of Spokane, our two outstanding colleges, Spokane Community College, led, led by Dr. Kevin Brockbank, who's seated at that table, and Dr. Nancy Zoffran, uh, who's the president of Spokane Falls Community College, is in our 30,000 students and 2,300 employees. I'm here to let you know that we are honored to serve our community. We're honored to be sponsoring uh, uh, this luncheon and a talk about uh, a meaningful work we do. We transform lives every day. We shape futures of individuals, of families, of the community, of the society, of our country. So we're very honored to be here again and uh, know that we too would uh, love to have your family members and your uh, employees join us for uh, any of the many degrees, 150 degrees that we offer combined at the two colleges and uh, help us keep our economy strong and competitive and help us also support the, the workforce for now and into the future. Thank you very much and thank you Todd. All right, <clears throat> thank you Dr. Johnson and also a special thank you to the Washington State University Health Sciences Spokane, another major sponsor of today's event. And thank you to our supporting sponsors, Integris Architecture, the University of Washington, and Whitworth University. Please join me in thanking them. So we also have the following companies represented today with display tables in the back of the room. The barcode, Numerica Credit Union and Spokane Federal Credit Union. So before you leave today, please take, uh, take a moment, stop by the table, say hi, and uh, learn more about uh, what they're up to and the things that they're working on. As our official uh, airline sponsor, we've done this before, some of you are getting used to this, uh, Tom Stanley with Southwest Airlines is here today to give away two tickets to any place in the U.S. where Southwest Airlines flies. Um, the winner has been randomly selected um, by those who pre-registered, so your names all went into a drawing, uh, and so um, and you must be present to win. So that's the other caveat. All right, so Tom, if you'll join me on stage, and uh, I will give Tom the certificates. All right, so we're gonna make this official with the envelope. All right, and the winner is Susan Ash. Are you in the room? If you, Susan, if you're in the room, I need you to come forward. All right, here we go. I know everybody wants to know who the next name was, but... Tom, thank you so much to you and the Southwest Airlines. Susan, congratulations. So I'd like to give a special recognition to our regional visionaries. These are those entities that are fundamental to the development of key community initiatives that GSI is tasked with, in, with including growing a, a thriving life sciences hub, increasing education attainment through greater minds, and advanced manufacturing industries, just to name a few. Our regional visionaries include Avista, Coles Company, MultiCare Health System, Providence Healthcare, Spokane County, and Washington Trust Bank. So um, uh, thank you to all of our visionary members for the work and um, for the investment that you're making in moving this community forward. Continuing the celebration of partnerships this morning, we'd like to take a moment to thank our nearly 1,000 members and a special member who is celebrating 50 years of GSI membership. We'd like to recognize the Association of Realtors. Um, thank you so much for your partnership through membership. We have Gina Mosey and Darren Watkins from the Association of Realtors with us today. Please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much.
So GSI's business development activities would not be possible without the support of our partner Spokane County. Kudos to Spokane County for all of your work to continue the momentum in our region and to build success along the way. So let's celebrate some small wins and recognize our community success. One recent success includes providing support for the relocation and expansion of precision cutting technology, who needed to double its square footage uh, and was considering alternative locations, including northern Idaho. The manufacturing company now will continue growing as a precision fabricator in Spokane County, which now employs 45 skilled employees in Liberty Lake. So these projects are long-term investments in the community. GSI first began working with precision cutting technology clear back in 2005. So thank you to Spokane County, thank you to the City of Liberty Lake, and the Washington State Department of Commerce for your support on this project. Thank you so much. Please join me. So this is just one highlight of Spokane County's recent accomplishments. To share more, I'd like to invite Mary, um, Commissioner Mary Cuny to the stage. And while she's working her way up, um, so Mary has lived in Spokane most of her life. She graduated from Central Valley High School and then from um, Gonzaga University with a degree in accounting. She is blessed to have met her husband Max here and they have raised two wonderful children. She is a CPA, an important thing for an elected official to bring to office, and previously served as the Chief Deputy Auditor for Spokane County before being appointed to the Commission in 2017 by Governor Inslee. She then won her election in November to finish her term as Commissioner. Mary is also a Spokane County business owner she has started two small businesses from scratch and made, a, um, made each a thriving, successful, and sustainable business. She has been, um, her family's construction business has been in Spokane for four generations, enabling economic development and providing hundreds of family wage jobs. It is both the large business experience as well as the entrepreneurial skills that she has brought to the Board of County Commissioners. So please join me in uh, welcoming Mary Cuny to the stage for the State of the County Address. Let's see, thank you Todd for that nice introduction and thank you all for being here today. I do wanna do an introduction of my family that's here today. Um, so I have my husband Max, um, our daughter Connie and our son Jeff, my mother, Mary Joyce Nelson, uh, my mother-in-law, Shelly Cuny, um, and my sister, Joan. So thank you all for being here to support me. For Some of you know me and some of you don't know me that well, and so I wanted to give a little bit of personal information about me and a little bit of family background, so that way you can understand where my values come from. So I'm going to start here with the fact that I am the youngest of five children, so yes, my sister here would tell you that I'm the baby of the family. Um, but the story of, of uh, our values comes from, I would say, my parents. So my dad served this great nation twice. He was drafted the first time at the end of World War II for, and served less than a year in the Air Force. Then when the Korean War came, he was drafted a second time and he spent three years in the Marines. So he, he served handed down that passion to my brother because my brother also served eight years in the Navy. So I understand the needs of our veterans. My mother, who's here today, she is the oldest of seven girls. Um, and when she was only eight years old, her mother passed away. And so she grew up in an orphanage in Sioux City, Iowa. And so family and her siblings were very important to her and that she passed that along to us. And so family is very important. With that then, they taught us that you pray to God, you be kind, you be compassionate, be honest, and really listen to people. And so those are the values that I bring to the Board of County Commissioners, and those are the values that I pass down to my children. So our son is an Eagle Scout and a sophomore at WSU, and our daughter is a structural engineer over in Seattle and is getting married next month. So. <laughs> So a busy time for us. Um, so today though, today is about the state of the county. Today is about a journey that I wanna take you on with me as I've been a commissioner for just over a year now. I wanna share with you 
the love that I have for Spokane County and why I think Spokane County is such a great place to be. It's not about the numbers today. So on the brochure on your table is the numbers that gives you all the budget information. Today, I wanna to take you on a journey that's gonna teach you the success through teamwork that is happening in Spokane County. We're gonna start with our first regional example of that. The history of Fairchild Air Force Base really started with the vision of the city leaders of Spokane and other community leaders who decided to organize a campaign to raise the money to buy the land that was donated to the War Department in 1941. That began what is now known as Fairchild Air Force Base and the more than 10,000 airmen and their families who live here. We're currently the world's largest air refueling wing and we're only getting bigger. We're adding more airmen, more aircraft here over the next two years and it's just a really exciting time. Really the spirit of teamwork is integral to Team Fairchild. In the Air Force, teamwork, we use the concept of the wingman, and that's somebody who always has your back and you can always count on to support you no matter what the task may be ahead of you. It's a really valuable concept for us. We have a lot of wingmen, not just the airmen that we serve with every single day, but our families and certainly the great community support we get here in the Spokane area. They are our true wingmen. Anytime we have any kind of issue at all, our community leaders, our business leaders, our partners throughout the region here, hey, how can we help? What do you need? How can we help get to yes? It's an incredible partnership. Later on this year, in September 2019, we'll host one of the Air Force's largest exercises. It's an exercise mobility guardian where Fairchild in Spokane is going to grow by about 3,000 airmen. And those airmen are coming from all across the rest of the U.S. military as well as several of our partner and allied nations. They'll come here to Spokane for about a month and train in all the uh, facets of mobility operations. So we're very excited about that. We absolutely could not do Team Fairchild. We could not do the rapid global mobility that our nation calls for for us to do without the community partnerships we have here in Spokane. Colonel, thank you very much for being part of the video for me. I appreciate it. So Fairchild is very important to Spokane County. It's our largest employer. And so we at the Board of County Commissioners work very hard to ensure that we're doing everything we can to support and enhance their mission. We're looking forward to the additional airmen and tankers that are coming in the fall. And again, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make you a success. So I've had the privilege recently in November to become an honorary base commander with Colonel Heathman as my, my cohort there. Um, he's the vice commander at Fairchild. It's been a pleasure so that way I get to understand Fairchild from the inside out and so I can be an advocate for them. Once I became an honorary commander with Fairchild, then uh, Colonel Brown, who is the commander for the survival school, asked me if I would become a national civic uh, leader for the Air Education and Training Command. Um, I said yes. <laughs> so I had the privilege of going down to San Antonio Texas to be at Randolph Air Force Base and to meet the gentleman whose picture you see me with is General Quast. He's a three-star general. He commands the Air Education and Training Command and I tell you it was such a privilege and an honor to get to spend time with him. He is a leader in every sense of the word. A story I'll tell you is that when we were getting a briefing from a young lieutenant uh, she was nervous just like I am right now. <laughs> and so, so the general did this great job of, you know, there was a point where he, you know, he could pause, and so he asked her to stop. He reiterated a point she was making. It gave her a chance to just relax, take a breath, and then he said, isn't she doing a great job to all of us? And we were all like, yes, she's awesome. And so then she was able to continue and do a great job and continue the great job she was doing. So that was one of those beautiful leadership moments that you really don't get that opportunity to see very often, especially from a three-star general. Thank you for the opportunity. And that will allow me now to go and advocate on your behalf, um, so on behalf of Fairchild and Spokane County, to make sure we're doing what we need to do for Fairchild. Great success through teamwork happens. The next project that I would like to talk about is the North Spokane Corridor.
So a little history on the North Spokane Corridor. It was first conceived in the mid-1940s, resurrected itself in the mid-60s into the 70s. It has grown, it's been through several studies. There was an EIS done in the early 1990s, basically put into motion the plan that we're using now. Our first ribbon cutting when we actually took funding to construction was in 2001. That launched the project. It's about half constructed. So as we were accumulating momentum, both financial and political, we started on the less expensive side. Through Connecting Washington, the last large fiscal package that we received, we have enough money now to complete the project. There's going to be quite a bit of activity around. It'll start this summer and it'll continue for 10 years or so. So when the 10 years are here and the facility is operating, it, it is going to be a game changer in a lot of ways. There are a lot of benefits. It moves regional traffic on a regional system. It opens up parts of Spokane for economic development. As an agency, DOT is a very significant freight organization, and so this, is, this has a, a large freight component. Along the way, while we're building this project and we're on this aggressive schedule, we're also taking the time necessary to connect with neighborhoods and stakeholders adjacent to the facility to build into the North Spokane Corridor a sense of place so that it is really owned by a community when we're done. So when thinking about the teamwork necessary to create a project like this, to envision it and then to get it funded, it doesn't happen without broad support. When I talk to folks about, you know, is this a DOT project, this is a regional project. It took the electeds, the executives from most of the organizations around the Spokane area, and many, many stakeholders, GSI, Downtown Partnership, AGC, for example, just to name three. It took that level of commitment, combined resources, combined political emphasis to actually get this project. So in many, many ways, from DOT's perspective, we view this as not our project, this is the region's project. So Mike's in the audience today, and I want to say thank you for doing that video for me as well. So with the North Spokane Corridor, you know, it's Spokane County, it's coming down into the city of Spokane, it's all these different areas, but it's all Spokane County. Uh, just, just to remind people, sometimes people think, oh, the city isn't part of the county, but it is all part of the county. A couple things that I want to talk about with the North Spokane Corridor. We're supposed to have more work starting this summer, and then if I heard right, in 10 years, Mike, it's going to be done? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I know happened um, with this North Spokane Corridor is it really took effort on the part of this community. It was the business community, it was the electeds, it was everybody coming together. And the person that really led that charge is Wayne Brokaw and AGC. So I want to recognize Wayne, he's in the audience here. Please stand, Wayne. <laughs> Thank you. He's retired now. He waited until it got, you know, got funded before he would retire from AGC. But it was the, the yellow button that you see up there. It was his Keep Spokane Moving um, organization that he started. I mean, I remember him going out and raising money to do the lobbying efforts and all of that. And so if it wasn't for Wayne rallying the troops to go to Olympia, to go to the legislature, to get the funding to happen, it wouldn't be here today. And we wouldn't have the optimistic point of view that in 10 years it will be completed. So again, I wanna say thank you very much, Wayne. And it was also the, the act of the legislature. You know, we had Senator Baumgartner um, in the Senate. We had Marcus Riccelli in the House. That it was them working across the lines that came together to fund that and make sure that it was a project for Eastern Washington. So a couple other projects I do wanna talk about while I'm talking transportation with Spokane County is the middle picture is a uh, ribbon cutting that we did on one of the phases of our Bigelow Gulch corridor. So our Bigelow Gulch corridor goes from the valley and is gonna feed, feeds into the North Spokane corridor. Again, just like the North Spokane corridor, it's for freight, it's for transportation, and it's for economic development. And so it's very important to us. The other area that I'd like to talk about is where the community came together here just recently is for the Geiger Boulevard interchange out on the West Plains. With Amazon facility going in and more businesses going in out there, it was very important for us to get funding moved up through the DOT so we can get that project done sooner. But also then, it was the partnership between the county, the West Plains PDA, 
and the DOT to go back to Olymp or go back to DC and lobby for that grant. So we got fourteen point one million dollars so that it can supplement that so we can get that done sooner than later and have that in infrastructure taken care of out there. So those are a couple of the great things that are doing when we all come together for transportation. The next item that I would like to talk about is one of our great intergovernmental uh, agencies and team showing teamwork. The history of the Spokane Airport Board dates all the way back to 1962, where the city and the county jointly formed this organization that has grown to be over a $43 million operating budget a year, with $51 million of capital improvements planned just as part of our 2019 budget. Some of the recent highlights are focused around our growth, both in 2017 growing at a little over 10 percent, and in 2018 growing at over 12 percent. That's 23 percent roughly in the last couple of years. Years, because of the growth that we have experienced, we're almost at 4 million total passengers last year. We are planning a new terminal renovation and expansion project, so we will have a new evolution in our security and in our baggage claim and also in constructing our gate areas, providing that front door friendly image for people coming into and out of our region. People that might want to start their next business in Spokane, people who might want to bring their family here, vacation here. It's so important that as we grow, we grow in the right way and preserve those things that are special and endearing about our community to those who visit from outside the region. Only through the community partnership and teamwork that we currently enjoy, I see Spokane International Airport growing into a world-class transportation, logistics, and aerospace manufacturing center. And I think we're going to get there by the cooperation that we currently have to deliver the infrastructure necessary to draw those businesses and expand organically the businesses that we currently have in the airport area. And I tell people, wherever I go, we are the model. We are the future of intergovernmental cooperation to make businesses successful in our community. Because when business is successful, our people are successful, our citizens thrive, our community prospers. And there are nobody else better in the world at doing that than our community here in Spokane. So Larry couldn't be with us today. He's back in D.C. lobbying um, for that passenger facility charge that everybody wants to have happen. But I just want to thank him for, for taking the time to do this for me as well. So Spokane International Effort, who wouldn't like 23% increase over the last two years in your revenues? <laughs> I mean, that's great. So with the passenger uh, increases going on, they've got this new renovation that's going to be happening to make it more convenient and easier for for these travelers. We all love Spokane International Airport because when we go, it's easy, you know? It's like the easiest airport that we can get into and get out of. So that's why we love Spokane International Airport. They've got the free Wi-Fi, free baggage carts, they've got the free car wash. <laughs> so we, that's why we love Spokane International Airport. And, and Larry Crowder at the helm has really done a phenomenal job. So. The other thing that's going on out at the West Plains that the airport is part of is that partnership for the West Plains PDA, the Public Development Authority. In 2017, when the city and the county came together along with the airport, you know, it stopped that fighting over those land issues because really the government's role is to provide that infrastructure to then allow for economic development to happen. Soon after it was formed, Commissioner French, I will give him full credit, he worked so hard to get that Amazon distribution facility in there. And with that, then it's kind of that ripple effect that starts to happen. As you can see, we've got the, the new interchange that's going to be happening soon. Just all those things happen, and so you start to see then the ripple effect of the businesses. We've got more uh, retail going in out there. We've got more manufacturing going in out there. You're going to be seeing it happen where that is just going to boom. And it's because, again, coming together between the city, the county, and the airport. So, again, that teamwork is what causes that success. So my next example that I would like to talk about is our conservation futures. When the citizens came together in 1994 and voted in a property tax to tax themselves, so that way then they could preserve land for the future generations, so that way we could have nature right next to us.
conservation future started way back in 1994 as a way to preserve land ahead of growth. The almost 8,000 acres that have been purchased by conservation futures include really popular well-known sites like Dishman Hills Conservation Area where Stevens Creek and Big Rock and Isler Creek are, to Salty's Uplands, which is a really popular mountain biking spot, to Slavin Conservation Area behind me. These areas provide not only habitat for wildlife, but it also provides a respite for residents here in the county to hike, to mountain bike, to horseback ride, and just experience what nature in Spokane County is all about. I mean, one of my favorite things about the county conservation areas is how different they are from one area to the next. They all have kind of a distinct personality and a really distinct ecology. You can be out here all four seasons. The introduction that I had to Slavin was actually on snowshoes. It's absolutely beautiful in the winter with just that smooth snow and the gorgeous lighting. What I really like about riding up in this area is it's the fun, moderate trails, the good intermediate level stuff for families and people of all ages and abilities and multi-use trails. So you can be up here hiking or biking, horseback riding and everything. You can't beat looking around at the Salties Uplands and over to Liberty Lake and the background of Micah Peak and Isler Creek off in the distance, Tower Mountain, it's just beautiful. Conservation Futures fills a really important gap within Spokane County. Unlike other counties throughout western U.S., there's no national forest land, there's very little federal land, and very little state land. And so Conservation Futures program and county parks is one of the major sources for open space areas and trails. And all these areas are available for free to enjoy. I climb it at the Big Rock because it's a place of adventure. You got this big beautiful face, the killer views, you never know what's going to happen. You'll see a moose coming over the horizon over there, there'll be your buddies on mountain biking coming by, you finish up the route, you want to take a hike, just see some killer views and just enjoy a great energy and a great place. Just one of those places where people ask why do you like it so much and it's kind of hard to say until you bring them up here. Then they understand it's kind of like a little piece of wild nature right in our backyard. 15 minutes to my front door. It's great. The County Conservation Futures program in particular is just an amazing program because of spaces like this. The county jumping in and using that funding to purchase these amazing green spaces that our communities and our families are going to be able to enjoy for generations to come. The Conservation Futures Program by Nature is a community supported program that thrives on teamwork. Casting the net wide at the beginning of any project creates a collaborative process where the community not only ends up with a better end product, but they become long term advocates and stewards for our public lands down the road. At Micah Peak, for example, we've had neighbors provide fill for our new trailhead and water from their own wells for compaction. They let us know when something's amiss, and believe it or not, they thank us for the work we do. This is the kind of team that allows our trails, trailheads, and conservation areas be the assets they are to our community. So the Conservation Futures Program has acquired over 8,000 acres since it started. We just recently added 231 acres at Etta Ranch out in the valley. New things that we're doing as well is we're putting webcams in at some of our trailhead locations. So Glen Rose, which is a new trailhead that just opened this last fall, and Stevens Creek now have webcams so you can go online, you can see how full the parking lot is, so you can make the decision where you want to go hike. Um, the other thing that happened is last night there was actually an open house for a new trailhead that is going to be looked at. It's called the Phillips Creek Trailhead. It's in the Ponderosa area. It's going to feed into Dishman Hills and the trail will take you from there all the way over across to the Glen Rose Trailhead. So when I was there last night, there was over 80 people there last night that were interested, concerned, had great responses to, you know, because we want to work with the community so that way that trailhead works for everybody. And so again, it's that partnership, it's that teamwork that really works to make it happen. So, it, and the other thing that we see with our citizens is they love our park system. You know, they love going and hiking. But it's also the citizens that have land, like the Phillips that I met last night. 
they're the one that sold the ranch to us, the acreage. So that way then we could you know, purchase that and put it into our conservation futures funds. And so those are the important things that those partnerships have. And people really want to come together. They want to have nature in their back door so they can, it's easy for them. And that's why people are choosing to live in Spokane County because of that. So I want to say thank you. I see Doug Chase and Paul Knowles out there who Paul did the video for me. So thank you very much for your effort. Because you guys were at Phillips Creek, the trailhead doing the presentation last night. So thank you. So the next thing that I want to look at, the next success through teamwork, is I want, we've looked regionally, now I want to look internal. So in Spokane County, teamwork works for successful projects. And so let's look at our projects. Our vision at Spokane County is to be the state's flagship government agency. We strive to be innovative leaders and provide customer-oriented services aligned to our community's needs. We have over 2,000 employees among 50 departments who are serving nearly a half million residents. Before I came to Spokane County in 2013, we had no strategic plans. One thing that came out of our 2014 strategic planning process was four key objectives that we really all need to focus on here at the county. One was customer service. How can we do a much more effective job serving our customers. The next was financial stewardship. We are the stewards of the public's money, so how do we do that even more effectively than we've been doing it? The third is public engagement. How do we become even more transparent and how do we include the public even more into the services and that, that we provide? And the fourth is employee development. We've got over 2,100 employees here at Spokane County and we just really had determined that we need to do a much better job developing them. The team-based approach allows individuals to have a voice through project ideas and actually seeing them implemented and being involved in that project. What you find when you have kind of a cross-area approach to projects, when you're gathering individuals from different departments to work on one central strategic project is you get a lot of diverse voices from different areas, different experiences. So you're going to see a lot more effective projects, better results. It's just the right way to do things. People feel more comfortable when they're in an environment where they understand the process, the process is repeatable, and that repeatable process leads to better outcomes. There's two things that were really rewarding for me. Getting the project done and that meeting where we showed it to the Board of Commissioners and they were really impressed with what we did, which made me feel really good about the project as a whole. Our team felt great about that. And then second, for me personally, I just recently got a promotion in IT and I think part of that is because of this project work. I learned a lot of skills and I got to show my management what I could do outside of my normal day-to-day -day functions and I think that helped my career here at the county. We've been in the position of uh, recruiting and hiring for full-time employees and this team-based approach has been going on at the county for two or three years now and it's been a great opportunity when talking with candidates who are really interested about opportunities for employee development. It's a question that comes up from your better candidates for sure and I've been able to talk about essentially the opportunity that does exist for those people who have the capacity to do a little bit more um, to work on projects even beyond the scope for what they're being hired for and I've found it personally to be a very powerful recruiting tool. So that's why we have such a bias towards our frontline staff being on these teams. They're doing the work. They know it better than anybody else. And when they have a very active role in doing our continuous improvement activities, the chance of success and the chance of those improvements sticking go up dramatically. People support a world they help create. So the team-based approach to projects has led us to develop several project management classes that have built a project management culture at the county. This has had tremendous benefit for the effectiveness of county government and has started to extend beyond to major organizations throughout the region like the City of Spokane, Avista, Delta Dental, and others. Now, I have to say that I've known the project management system from the inside 
um, out. So as Chief Deputy Auditor, I was on several of those project committees. I actually managed one of them. And so with that, I understand how that project charter starts, how you keep you know, to those strategic objectives that you're trying to do for that project. You don't let scope creep happen. You, and then you get to complete the project. You know, how many of us have projects that are out there that it just seems to hang on forever? What we do and teach in those classes is it's in a six to eight month time window, and so you get to complete it, and you need to complete it. And if you can't, we will help you. So these are a couple of the projects that we had, the records retention process, where we took thousands of people, I mean, uh, probably more than thousands of pieces of paper out of Spokane County because the records were beyond our retention schedule. So why were we keeping them? So everybody got to go through their old files. Um, I think the clerk's office is probably one of the best examples of how many pieces of paper they got out of their office. Our campus, campus signage improvement process project was one of those where now when you come to the campus, we've got signs on the outside to help guide you. The next phase will be looking at it internally. So, but again, breaking it up so that way your project can be completed is an important piece of what we do with our projects. And we couldn't do it without all of our staff. And like we've heard earlier, there's 2,100 employees at Spokane County, and they are a huge part of our team. And so I know Charlotte kind of kind of had everyone stand up, but I am going to then also recognize the people that are part of my team at Spokane County. And so I want to say, Commissioner Kearns, you're here. Would you stand? Thank you. Commissioner French is in DC, so he is not here. If I could have the rest of the electeds from Spokane County stand, and then I'm going to have all the employees that are here, because I know that there's a lot all the way back there. OK, thank you all. Because it truly is a team, and without everybody working together, we wouldn't make it happen. So the last thing that, last video that I have today that is an example of teamwork and success is the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council. And, and I would say that this is a continuing success that we're going to have here. This is that continuing conversation that we're looking at at Spokane County. So public safety uses a majority of our general fund dollars. We are having a collaborative conversation where we bring all voices to the table for Spokane County to address law and justice reform. A primary goal is to reduce our jail population while increasing public safety. So let's take a look. The Spokane Regional Law and Justice Council is really an advisory body that is comprised of stakeholders from across the criminal justice system, from our judges, law enforcement, prosecutors, public defenders, who all come together and meet monthly to discuss different issues occurring and arising in our criminal justice system and brainstorm solutions to areas that need to be addressed. The real value of bringing everyone together with the Law and Justice Council is to have everyone's voice heard. There's not one singular voice in criminal justice. There's a myriad of different people who have different interests and also different responsibilities. And if we don't talk to them all, if we don't ask the questions and vet out solutions, we're not going to get a real solution that works for everyone. Our focus isn't about a singular item, it's about a collective whole. One of the interesting things that we've done here in Spokane in our region is that we have expanded our SRLJC to include not just the statutory members, we have included a number of community members. And those community members are folks who are previously incarcerated, folks who work out in the community with people recently released from incarceration, and people who represent victims' rights. So that's a little bit different than what the statute requires. So we have a lot that we can be learning from these individuals, and I'm hoping that we're gonna learn a lot more as time goes on. 
When I look at the vision, I look at the inclusivity of it, the transparency, the community's voice being brought forward, being amplified, and the system professionals really listening to what the community wants and desires. A common saying is those who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. We get closer and closer to those outcomes to where we're able to work in unison. We're able to hear one another, really strategize towards making the goal whatever creates our thriving community. It's important that everybody come to the table so we can hear what the needs are, develop a strategy, and move this community forward. We've opened it up to the public, which I am a fan of opening things up to the public, but it can't be at the expense of progress. The voters elected us to do a job. It's time for us to start doing that job. I'm really excited about the direction that the council is going now. We have a lot of important issues that we're talking about right now from mental health to a potential new jail to the disproportionality in contacts with the justice system and community of color. So there's a lot of important things that we are working through and work, we're working through these collaboratively and we're working the, through these things, respecting each other's opinions and we're making progress. I feel like when we're, we're meeting together, we're actually moving these issues forward and it's challenging. When you have all these different lenses, all these different perspectives, all these different passions, trying to, to get everyone to come to the table and be able to work together collaboratively is very challenging. And I feel like we are really starting to do that now. So as you can see, the flow chart that's up there, that shows our law and justice system. And it takes everyone working together that is going to help us to find those efficiencies and those improvements. It's not going to be one person wanting to do something different. We've all got to have that conversation where we're coming together to find that right solution. One of the things that's happened for Spokane County is that we have received this MacArthur Foundation grant money. So we have received $3.8 million of funding to help us in our criminal justice system and our criminal justice reform. As you can see on the map there, the, of 10 people that received, 10 organizations that received it, we are one of the only ones on the West Coast that got that. They gave that to us because they knew we were, we had our Law and Justice Council going, we are having those tough conversations, and so they felt that it was worth the investment in us, and they've continued to invest in us because we are making strides. The other thing that we're doing in our Law and Justice system is we are also working on mental health. So the mental health diversion facility that the city and county is working on for law enforcement is one of those things that we are looking to, to have for our community. So that way, if there is a situation right now, law enforcement, what they do, if there's a, a crisis, they will either take the person to the emergency room or they go to jail. So we want to have that option where someone can volunteer to go into a treatment facility to get services so they can get help and not be in our criminal justice system. The other thing that is happening right now is with our sheriff's department, where we have mental health workers that are now riding along with our sheriff's deputies, so that way when they encounter somebody, they can actually de-escalate the situation right there on, on site. And again, not have to go anywhere else. And then those mental health providers know the services and can tell them and talk to them about the services that are available and get the, get the treatment for them. We're seeing about 85% of the time that they're out on these type of calls that they're getting services instead of going into our system. So that's a win, especially when, I, as I said to start with, it's a major hit to our budget is our criminal justice system. So the more that we can help our citizens be healthy and happy, the better we're going to be on our budget side with our criminal justice system. And, and I want to tell you that the county commissioners are committed to having these tough discussions in this next year so we can make the path forward that we need. So in closing, there's one thing that's near and dear to my heart, and it's this Head Start to Construction program. So I want to talk about it because I see it as one of the true successes of people coming together and making, making good things happen. So it started with Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich and Reverend Happy Watkins. They had a conversation that they were trying to figure out how do we get the youth in our community jobs, get them out of this cycle. So Ozzy, his go-to person is Judith Gilmore. So then Judith Gilmore went to AGC, the apprenticeship program, 
and said, what do we need to do? And so with the help of AGC, they started the Head Start to Construction program. So it helps, um, they do small cohorts and they've done several of them across the city and the county that they learn, it's a six week training program where they learn yoga, they learn positive affirmations, they learn their OSHA requirements, they learn basic construction skills. So when they get out, they have the potential to get a job. We have seen it at Geiger, they've done, uh, they're in their third class right now, we've seen two classes. When I went out for the graduation for the second class, the um, corrections officer said, you know, that first class that was here and you, you saw at the graduation, he says, I would have normally seen several of those guys back. He says, I have not seen any of them back. So we have seen over the course of the first two that we've done that only 10% of the people that are doing it are reoffending. So again, if we can get that programming and get them jobs, that is so helpful for all of us. So when I do the graduations, I tell people, I wear three hats. I wear the hat of a county commissioner. And so I'll tell you that as a county commissioner, we want you to be successful. We want you to get a job and we want you to help build our community. My second hat is the wife of a general contractor who's part of AGC. And I tell them that they need workers. So if you're willing to work, they're gonna put you to work. So, and then you're gonna have that ability to go, you're gonna feel that pride when you go around and you say, I helped build that building, or I helped build that bridge. The third hat that I wear is the hat of the board member for Hutton Settlement. And so I tell them that your kids and your family love you unconditionally, and they want nothing but to be proud of you. So go out and make them proud. So in conclusion today, I have a quote that I'd like you to see that is on teamwork from Henry Ford. Coming together is a beginning, Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. So I thank you for being here today. I thank you for being engaged in our community. I thank you for continuing to be engaged in our community because there are lots of discussions out there that we need your engagement. And it truly is only through success with teamwork that we're gonna make it happen. So thank you very much. Did you want to see if they have any questions? Uh, wow. All right. Well, we're actually running a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, what a fantastic presentation. Commissioner Cuny, thank you very much. Um, a lot going on in this community, a lot of collaboration going on in this community, and I think that's what sets us apart from others. We have time for questions. If any of you have questions of what's going on in the county or of uh, Commissioner Cuny, uh, please raise your hand and we'll um, try to take a, just a couple before we close up. So anyone? Yay. All right, <laughs> all right, well thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, well this event has certainly been an excellent highlighter of uh, all the partnerships taking place in the region. Uh, everything from what's been highlighted in the speech today, Fairchild Air Force Base, the North Spokane Corridor, and all the other transportation projects that are so important to the entire region. Uh, Spokane International Airport that we're very proud is one of the fastest growing airports in the nation uh, of its size and trying to stay ahead of that demand. And certainly the Conservation Futures programs that help us get out and enjoy our surroundings. Uh, um, certainly, and, and then thank you for all the programs, good management practices uh, with your internal strategic goals and focus uh, and everything you're doing there. It's important to, um, to come together as a community. It's important to advocate on behalf of this community. And so with that, I would like to invite you to partner with us and represent your local business community. We do a couple of trips every year. We do a, a, a Olympia, fly in to advocate to our state legislature on behalf of this region. But we also do a DC fly in, uh, and that's our annual federal legislative trip to Washington, DC. This trip will take place April 9th through 11th, providing participants an opportunity to meet with Washington State's congressional delegation and senior White House and federal agency officials. So I would encourage you to join us if you're interested and continue the work to make the Spokane region a great place to live and work. 
Again, those dates are April 9th through 11th, coming soon. Just happens to hit at the peak of the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival in uh, D.C. So it should be a, a beautiful time to be there. For more information about this event, please reach out to any of the GSI staff members that you see present uh, at the event today or visit our website. Um, before we move on, I also want to give recognition to the GSI staff for all the work that they do and help uh, in putting this event together. So um, I don't know where they are, but if you're in the room, please stand, uh, step in. Thank you so much for putting this together. I want to thank you, um, a big thank you to our title and luncheon sponsor, Spokane Federal Credit Union. Thank you, Charlotte. Our major sponsors, Community Colleges of Spokane, Chancellor, um, thank you so much. Washington State University Health Sciences, Spokane. To our supporting sponsors, Integris Architecture, the University of Washington, and Whitworth University. And of course, for our official airline sponsor, Southwest Airlines, I think people are beginning to look forward to this stuff. Um, uh, if anything, hopefully we're trying to send the message that um, to enter into these drawings, it's when you pre-register, that's when your name goes into the drawing and uh, provides a great potential opportunity for you to, uh, to get away. So don't forget to stop by our display tables in the back of the room, uh, the barcode, Numerica Credit Union, and Spokane Federal Credit Union. With that, have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend and uh, look forward to spring. Thank you very much.